Hello and welcome to the CS4 interview. Joining me this week is Dr. Helen Zersky from University College London, who later on is going to be talking about bubbles and their importance in the climate system. Hello, welcome. Hello. Thanks for coming. It's nice to be back. It, it is, yes. Um, I, I was going to say formally of the University of Southampton, <laughs> but, you know, our loss is UCL's gain, but there you go. Right. So, um, you're a renowned bubble scientist, and you're interested in things that go pop, uh, but you started your research career with things that went bang, right? Yeah. Explosive physics, um, experimental physics. So, were you one of those kids that are always blowing things up? Or? No, I wasn't actually. And I've learned far more practical ways of blowing things up through people saying, oh, you used to explode it. When I was a kid, I used to put lighter fluid in beer bottles and throw a match inside. So, um, I definitely am good at practical explosives in a lab environment. I'm not sure I'm a potential terrorist. Although oh, I could good. do some damage with what I can find in Sainsbury's, I try not to. Okay, so what was the attraction of explosive physics then? Is it, is it because the mass is hard, or is it because you can make things go bad? No, it's because human beings, it occurred to me quite early on, that human beings are very slow, complex organisms, and that we, there can be things that happen very quickly, and that are very small, that are right in front of our nose that we can't see, that we can't perceive. And I was fascinated by that world. You know, we're, the time it takes you to blink your eye, for example, about a third of a second. And in that time, all sorts of things can be happening right here, and you just can't see them. And I was fascinated by that world. And so the studies I was doing with explosives were using a lot of high-speed photography. They're actually looking at the moment just before the explosive goes bang, looking at the processes leading up to that, because the rules are different in that world. When you're at very, very high speed and very, very short timescales, the rules are completely different. I mean, the same basic physics applies, but the way it, you know, sort of, what happens in reality is very different. So I was fascinated by that world. And then after I'd done a PhD in explosives and had blown a lot of things up, um, I'd learned these techniques for looking into that world. And I went looking for something else that I could apply it to. And um, bubbles kept, you know, I read, I spent six months reading about different fields of science and this thing about bubbles kept coming up. And the thing is that when bubbles break apart and join together, they're doing it on very, very short timescales and it's very, very small. And you see it every day, whenever you pour out a glass of water, you see bubbles forming, and there's all sorts of things going on that you, you know, we're just too slow. And I wanted to know, you know, we're too slow to see it, and I wanted to know what was going on in that world. So I then used all those same experimental techniques to study bubbles in the ocean, and that led me into oceanography. Okay, um, and hence your connections with the University of Southampton. Um, now, uh, people who follow you on Twitter, or people who might have known what you've been up to before Christmas, would have known that you were on this um, cruise. Uh, which I think is actually the worst way to describe uh, hell in an aquatic environment because uh, it was uh, tremendous storms, massive waves, um, boredom interspersed with periods of terror with a constant drumbeat of sickness. So does that demonstrate your love of bubbles? Because you're out there to get some data for an important experiment, right? Yes. Well, the first thing is that the word cruise is very misleading because people hear the word cruise and they think of holidays and, you know, pina coladas on the poop deck and stuff, and it's not like that. Research ships are very functional places, um, and we were out there to study storms. It turns out that the bubbles underneath breaking waves out at sea help the ocean breathe, and we understand little bits about that process, but not very much, and it's one of the jigsaw pieces that makes up the Earth's system. It's important to weather and climate. Um, you know, the atmosphere is massive, the ocean is massive, but that layer that connects the two together is very, very thin. Anything that goes from one massive thing to the other has to go through that thin layer, and the bubbles are there helping those processes along. Um, and so, so the sea surface is very important, and the bubbles in it are very important. And what we were doing was measuring during big storms, um, because when you get very, very high winds and they you know, you get huge waves growing and then breaking, you're mixing up air and water. This is the place where the ocean is breathing in and breathing out. Um, and so the aim was to measure in high wind conditions, which translates to storms, in order to look directly at that process, to watch how the ocean is breathing. And my part of it is to understand the mechanisms, what tiny things are happening to make that huge process of ocean breathing happen. Mm -hmm. So you've got these two massive reservoirs, but then this very um, kind of thin membrane. It's got a complex membrane over which the gaseous exchange is happening. And that's where you're looking. And yeah. you generated a lot of data with this bespoke buoy thing that we're throwing into these stormy waves, right? Horrifying amounts of data. So we had an 11 meter spar buoy, which means it, um, it, it's sort of like a big yellow stick that sits upright in the water. The top two meters was above the water. Everything else was below. And what that means is that we can look at what's happening under the sea surface. And the reason that's important is that when we see a breaking wave, you know, from a ship or from a pier, 
you see all this white foam on top, but you don't see what's happening underneath. And what's happening underneath is that as the wave breaks, there are enormous plumes of bubbles hidden below the surface. And that's where the real sort of work goes on when it comes to these breathing processes. So if you have a floating uh, buoy like the one we had, we had a camera that could look down from above and then different measuring devices at different depths to look at what was happening underneath the water. So the idea is to, to capture the surface of the ocean during these enormous events so that we can try and understand the mechanisms that, that are contributing um, to the breathing process. And we weren't alone. These are all big team collaborative efforts. So there were lots of other people on the ship making lots of different measurements, measuring the gases going up and down, measuring the, the wave state, measuring the winds, lots of different things. And so we are part of a much larger data set, actually. And the idea is to be able to piece all these jigsaw pieces together um, to understand what's happening in these very violent events at sea. Okay. So uh, the term big data, it gets used uh, with teeth grindingly uh, high frequency, but you've generated a lot of data. So uh, what do you want to do with this data, uh, or what would you want people to do with this data? I think this data has a lot of potential, and I think we're only going to learn how much as we go. I see it as, a, as information about a web of processes, but it's not perfect information, obviously. We have got 20 terabytes of data just from one cruise. It's, it terrifies me every time I think about it. It's um, backed up. It's yeah. a lot of, it is backed up. It's a lot of information. And although backing up one of the drives it's on would take about three weeks, and that's, not, that's only a part of the data. It, it was the backup process that really brought home how much data there was, mm -hmm. actually, because it took so long. Um, so the thing about this is that we don't know which connections are most important. In order to be useful to the Met Office, for example, who have a weather and climate model, we need to be able to take all those complex processes and pull out the most impo important parts to use in a bigger model. Like we can't tell them every single thing about the salinity, the temperature, what biology is in the water, you know, what the sea state is. We need to be able to find the most important processes and understand the physics so that we can sort of give them a parameterization of all those processes. And so the overall aim is to provide something to weather and climate models which is useful, which says if you get a big storm at sea in these conditions, this is what actually happens. But connecting what the conditions are and what happens is this big mess of mechanisms and interacting things and things that affect other things and non-linear processes. And that's what our data set is. And so in a way, firstly, it's really exciting because no one has ever measured such a comprehensive bubble data set in these conditions. This really is the first time we've even got a chance at really piecing this together. Um, but in a way, it's also a fishing expedition because, because no one's ever had data quite like this. We don't know what we're looking for. We don't know what the most likely correlations are. And there's so many different variables that there are two ways to approach it. You can either you know, pick two variables you think might be correlated and go looking for a correlation, or you can somehow look at the structure of the data from the other end and find the variables that are correlate, correlated the other way. And that potentially is much more useful. And that's the, the use of this data set, I think, is that we might find, hopefully, we'll find ways of understanding and parameterizing this mass of physics in a way which is directly useful to climate modelers. And we'll, I think, potentially, if the data was used well, we could do a really good job of prioritizing how to look at the physics. Mm -hmm. Well, you're certainly in the right place when it comes to analysis of large data sets and complex systems. Good. <laughs> um, and people are already coming in uh, to your talk to, to start uh, the interview. Right. But thanks again for coming. I do appreciate you're really rather busy these Very days. Well. <laughs> um, if you'd like to see interviews with other CS4 speakers or even their actual video lectures, then please visit uh, cs4southampton.wordpress.com. Thanks for watching. <laughs>